Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. A seed planted today takes root and grows into a tree that bears fruit in the future. Over 110 years ago, a seed was planted. Today, that seed, the idea of excellence, has grown into the University of Pretoria, South Africa's largest contact research-intensive university. Nine faculties and a business school are spread across seven beautiful campuses, which are home to over 50,000 students, ready to make an impact in the world beyond university and join our global network of nearly 300,000 alumni. Future-focused, sustainably developed facilities and cutting-edge multi- and transdisciplinary research are underpinned by a desire to transform lives and have a positive impact on communities and the world. Excellence in teaching, learning, research innovation, arts and culture, and sports puts us firmly amongst the world's best universities. Knowledge is not just what is in books, it is the wisdom to apply it, to nourish and nurture the seed so that it takes root, grows tall, bears fruit and branches out. UP plants that seed, that tiny bit of curiosity, creativity, critical thinking, hope, the desire to care, respect, help and innovate against all odds, to grow, to leave your mark, to excel, to challenge the norm, to think, to rethink, to discover, to inquire, to lead, to have courage, to make a difference and to persevere. This is the University of Pretoria. We make today and every day matter. Welcome. Welcome to this webinar. Um, we hope uh, that you can hear us uh, well and that those who wish to use interpretation into Spanish and French will select the relevant language on your screen. We are thankful to the Swiss government for sponsoring the interpretation and to the communications department at the University of Pretoria for their support in the organization of this event. Welcome to everyone. Good day and we are really uh, it's a great pleasure for us to welcome you, all participants, in today's webinar on assemblies. Peaceful and not so peaceful assemblies often. Organized by the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, together with the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We know our audience and participants are in many different time zones, and we really are delighted that you are able to join us today. So now uh, I will just say a few words in English, uh, I've already indicated, but in French perhaps now, for our global audience that we have with us today. Nous espérons que vous nous entendez bien et que ceux qui souhaitent utiliser l'interprétation vers l'espagnol ou le français choisiront la langue appropriée sur votre écran. Nous sommes reconnaissants du gouvernement de Suisse d'avoir sponsorisé l'interprétation et au département de, la, de communication de l'Université de Pretoria pour son soutien dans l'organisation de cet événement. Esperamos que puedan escucharnos con claridad. Para aquellos que deseen utilizar la interpretación al español o al francés, pueden seleccionar el idioma relevante en su pantalla. Asimismo, me gustaría agradecer el gobierno de Suiza for hacerse cargo de la interpretación y al Departamento de Comunicación de la Universidad de Pretoria por su apoyo en la organización de este evento. I will now switch back to English. We are delighted to be joined by an eminent panel of experts today who will discuss two important new United Nations documents dealing with peaceful assemblies as well as with assemblies where violence is present. Yes, as we all saw over the last couple of 
years and indeed decades, demonstrations have become one of the keys and most powerful ways in which people express themselves collectively, uh, especially in the recent times. Many of the major human rights breakthroughs, in fact, of our era have come about because of people taking to the streets and saying out loud, here I am, take notice of me and what I have to say. One can think about Mahatma Gandhi here in South Africa at the beginning of the last century with the Satyagra and later mass action brought, that brought about the end of apartheid and also uh, the women marching in England to win the right to vote uh, through their protests in the 1920s. And certainly also in the United States, United, United States of America, the civil rights movement that brought about profound changes in, in that country. Also, at the end of the 1980s, I think we'll all recall uh, the protests that brought about the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Velvet Revolution in the ex-Czechoslovakia. But at the same time, we are also reminded of the downside of, of these assemblies, uh, exemplified by the tragedy in Tiananmen Square, and also here, more close to home, the uh, incidents and the killing of people in Soweto, 1976. I would certainly agree with you, uh, Prof, uh, on those points that you've raised. And I would also add that more recently, there has been really an outpouring of mass action globally, especially by young people on environmental issues, LGBTI issues, the rights of indigenous people, uh, the, Black Lives like the Black Lives Matter movement, and other similar issues have fueled protest. And we are all following the news at the moment about assemblies in Hong Kong, China, Belarus, and many Latin American countries such as Chile, Colombia, and Venezuela. In many cases, progress is being made, but all too often there is excessive use of force. And we know the far right wing groups are also using this modern tool. Yes, indeed, Abigail. And as you mentioned, in 2020, the United Nations adopted two key documents on how assemblies should be approached. These two documents have been described as game changers um, as far as the management of assemblies is concerned. In July 2020, the United Nations Human Rights Committee adopted General Comment 37 on the right of peaceful assembly. And in the same month, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights launched the final version of the UN guidelines on less lethal weapons in law enforcement. Indeed, we're very proud of those developments, um, not only as an office, but globally indeed. So today we have the opportunity to discuss new developments with experts in the area and with a global audience. The, the CVs of all participants are now available on the website for which the URL is also now being provided in the chat box. Here to welcome us, before we turn to the panel, are the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria and the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights at the United Nations. It is indeed my pleasure to ask the Vice Chancellor of the, United, the University of Pretoria, Professor Tawane Kupe, to welcome all participants with us today. Professor, over to you. Thank you, Ms. Abigail Noko. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. Ms. Ize Branske Harris, Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, Clement Vole, Special Rapporteur, Professor Christoph Haynes, UN Human Rights Committee, Ms. Barbara Fontana, Swiss Government, Francesca Fanucci, European Center for Nonprofit Law, Commissioner Louis Carol Hiro, Professor Franz Vajun, Director of the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, Judge Albi Sachs, retired Constitutional Court Judge. All protocol observed. Welcome to this global webinar on peaceful and not so peaceful assemblies, a fresh look at the international standards. As the principal and vice chancellor of the University of Pretoria in South Africa, my institution is honored to co-host this event with the UN Office of the High Commission for Human Rights. We are honored to be collaborating with the UN and its agencies at multiple levels. We are all highly familiar with the term essential services. And in this webinar is a different version of an essential service in the form of an essential global discussion at a time when we are witnessing escalating mass assemblies, gatherings and protests throughout the world. 
the right to peaceful assembly and the judicious use of less lethal weapons in law enforcement is a fundamental human right and something that every country in the world needs to address, informed by the two recently published United Nations documents on these issues that we're discussing today. The General Comment 37 on the right of peaceful assembly and the human, UN Human Rights Guidance on less lethal weapons in law enforcement. The University of Pretoria, or UP as we call it, is particularly proud that Professor Christoph Haynes and his colleagues from the UP Center for Human Rights have been centrally involved in the development of both documents. As Professor Haynes will explain, the general comment clarifies the status of several publicly contested facets of the right to protest. It states, for example, that the right to peaceful assembly applies indoors and outdoors, and in private and in public spaces, and breaks new ground by recognizing that the right applies not only offline, but also online. It further explains that while the state may regulate the time, place, and manner of demonstrations, it may not, as a general rule, regulate the content of demonstrations. So, even if you are promoting an unpopular idea, you still have the right to peaceful assembly. Many of us know firsthand how easily peaceful gatherings can turn violent, often through mismanagement or as a result of intolerant authoritarian governments. We have witnessed exemplary behavior by some law enforcement authorities, but too often we have also witnessed the excessive use of force by others with the use of lethal and less lethal weapons. Less lethal weapons include police batons, tear gas, tasers, rubber or plastic bullets, dazzling weapons, water cannons, and acoustic weapons. Less lethal weapons allow officials to apply varying degrees of force in situations where it would be unlawful to use firearms loaded with lethal ammunition. The UN guidance does not use the term non-lethal, given that the use of any weapon can have fatal consequences. In South Africa, there are around 12,000 demonstrations per year, and the right of peaceful assembly is, is jealously and constitutionally guarded because it can too easily be taken away. In South Africa, peaceful or non-violent protests gained prominence during Mahatma Gandhi's time in South Africa. He lived in Johannesburg from 1903 to 1913, and he led the first passive resistance campaign in 1906 in opposition to laws forcing Indians to carry passes and restricting their movement. The denial of freedom of movement goes hand in hand with the denial to the right of peaceful assembly and a slew of other freedom-limiting laws. Apartheid South Africa under Nationalist Party rule offers a perfect example, I bet a very bad one. 64 years ago, the right of peaceful assembly was denied to the majority of South Africans in the form of what was called the Riotous Assemblies Act, Act number 17 of 1956. It prohibited gatherings in open air public spaces if the Minister of Justice considered they could endanger the public peace. A year before, in 1955, the African National Congress, which had not yet been banned, called together a number of political groups to a meeting to adopt what is known as the Freedom Charter. Over 3,000 people showed up and the document was adopted. It stated that South Africa belongs to all its inhabitants, black and white. It demanded a non-racial democratic system of government and equal protection for all people before the law. It sought equal work and educational opportunities and a number of other fundamental human rights. It is no coincidence that several months later, the Riotous Assemblies Act was passed. In the same period, several other laws throttling the majority of South Africans' human rights were passed. In 1956, for example, the Native Urban Areas Amendment Act was passed. This enabled municipalities to expel any black person from any area 
was considered a threat to the maintenance of peace and order. It made failure to obey the ejection order a punishable offense. Any person who received two such orders within five years could be confined to a particular area. And so the news tightened with the excessive use of force by both the police and military against any black person deemed to be causing trouble. Lethal and less lethal weapons were used indiscriminately against black people and anyone deemed to be an enemy of the apartheid state. As happens worldwide, protesters defy laws that bind them. In South Africa in 1960, for example, a series of anti-apartheid processes were planned defying both the government's countrywide ban on public meetings as well as what were known as the pass laws, which meant that by law, black people had to carry a pass wherever they went to restrict their freedom of movement. Things turned violent, and in March 1960, during what is known as the Sharpville Massacre, the protests ended in bloodshed when police opened fire on several thousand people, killing 69 people and injuring over 250. Fast forward to the UN documents being discussed today, which are all about trying to prevent atrocities such as Sharpville. South Africa continues to struggle with this as the recent Marikana massacre has shown. The guidance on less lethal weapons in law enforcement emphasizes that law enforcement officers shall be trained in the lawful use of force. This should include training on the applicable human rights principles and standards, on how to avoid the use of force, including through de-escalation techniques, mediation and effective communication. And where absolutely necessary, what level of force to use. The guidance is that law enforcement officials in performing their duties shall not discriminate against any person on the basis of race, ethnicity, color, sex, sexual orientation, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, disability, property or birth or other similar criteria. As Prof. Haynes explains, guidance is one thing, the application of this guidance is another. He offers the example of South Africa where our laws are progressive and largely in line with international standards, where the governing of peaceful protests and the use of force is concerned. Yet, like many other countries, too often, South Africa still makes use of excessive force during assembles and during the enforcement of state of emergency controls on public behavior, such as lockdown regulations. Part of the problem is insufficient training, and hence the law enforcement officers do not have the discipline and restraint required. South Africa is also a very violent society with an entrenched police culture of using force. It goes further than this. Law enforcers are, after all, members of society. Like all of us, they are culturally and ideologically conditioned in a variety of ways, often with specific prejudices and fears, which too easily kick in when they are required to make split-second decisions in dealing with incidents of potential violence or actual violence. The same goes for participants in assemblies. If you have grown up fearing the police or black people or white people or gay people or men or people of a different religious persuasion, it requires concerted and ongoing transformation to change this and to nurture all people in society away from prejudice in order to normalize cultural diversity, inclusion and integration. This needs to be done at a national, organizational and individual level. All people need to be exposed in the long term to deep level transformation in order to start living the values of diversity, equality, inclusion, liberty, and decent citizenship. All societies need to encourage the recognition of equal human rights at every level, whereas we are very regrettably seeing the opposite in many countries, including in established democracies like the United States. Towards achieving the transformation required, there is no better roadmap than the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs as they are popularly known. And I'm proud to say they are integral to the Investor Pretoria, or UP as we call it, 
which is the convening hub for all South African stakeholders interested in contributing to South Africa's attainment of the SDGs. Allow me to use uh, UP as an example of what we are attempting to achieve in terms of advancing human rights, liberties and freedoms, including peaceful assemblies. At UP, we have very clear transformation goals and our ongoing commitment is to work at strengthening an inclusive institutional culture where diversity is valued and welcomed, where different perspectives are respectfully heard, and where every individual feels a sense of belonging and inclusion. Yet not very long ago, UP was the flagship of African nationalism, where Africans was the language of instruction and the campus was dominated by white African students. This is not the case anymore, and we are proud of our diverse campus, where tolerance and inclusivity is being nurtured and no student with abilities excluded for any reason. Change in attitude is further brought about by our academic demographics, where we are concertedly working towards a 50 plus percentage of women professors and mainstreaming women into the top leadership. This equally applies to our black academics. The, app the appointment Development, advancement, and retention of black academics is a key area in our university's employment and equity plan and our plan to create a transformed, inclusive, and equal uh, institution. In addition to this, at UP, about 45% or 30,000 students in our total student body are directly involved in community projects and engagement and practical work as part of their curriculum. Why do we do this? It is to develop graduates with empathy, who are socially sensitive, demonstrate emotional intelligence, graduates who no longer discriminate against any person on the basis of race, ethnicity, color, sex, sexual orientation, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, disability, property or birth. Graduates who are committed to improving our democracy, enhancing human rights, helping to achieve the SDGs and playing their part as future leaders in every part of society. The world urgently needs leaders at every level with foresight and wisdom who are well-educated, well-skilled and well-rounded. Leaders who see the way forward to creating a better world than we live in right now. This is the route to enhancing fundamental human rights, to adding to these rights worldwide and to encouraging everyone to live by them. Thank you, and uh, I look forward to a very, very rich discussion and debate. Thank you very, very much, Professor Coupe, for those um, warm, welcoming words and also very informative remarks, providing a context to our webinar. I now like to ask Ms. Ilse Brandskeres, uh, to also welcome the participants. But before we give her the floor, may I just mention that Ms. Brandskeres was actually, until earlier this year, a member of the United Nations Human Rights Committee. And then obviously in that capacity, she was quite intimately involved in the drafting of uh, General Comment 37. So thank you very much for agreeing also to be with us and over to you uh, to welcome our participants, Ms. Brandskeres. pleasure to be here with you and and certainly with my friend and colleague Christoph Heinz as well who had such a leading role in in both of these documents so I'm I'm very pleased to be given the opportunity to take part in today's global webinar to discuss the Human Rights Committee's general comment 37 on article 21 uh, on the right to a peaceful assembly and the United Nations human rights guidance on less lethal weapons in law enforcement, the documents that already have been mentioned. Recovering from the atrocities of war, genocide, colonial oppression and economic devastation were driving factors for the codification of collective hopes for the elevation of human dignity and the alleviation of preventable human suffering into an international bill of rights through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. 
The two covenants have been a safeguard for the lives of millions of women, men and children over the past 54 years. They have helped to shape the constitutions of many states and they provide the ground for many legal legal many national legal systems. They have taught us to fight discrimination, whether based on race, gender, ethnicity, religious faith, political opinion, sexual orientation, or any other characteristic. They have guided us on building rule of law institutions that are impartial, transparent, and accessible. They have demonstrated that policy can be securely anchored in the expressed will of the people when there is greater freedom. As the world looks to recover from one of the most global and serious crises since the adoption of this Bill of Rights, it has never been more pertinent to recall the human rights principles embodied by the ICCPR and the ICSCR. As the Secretary General set out in his policy brief on COVID-19 and human rights this April, the pandemic is a human rights crisis and to be addressed successfully, both response and recovery have to place human rights at their center. To recover better, freedom of peaceful assembly as a fundamental right within the ICCPR plays a central role. Over the last year, the COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented challenges to the full realization of Article 21. At the same time, protests have taken place across the world on a diverse range of issues, including Black Lives Matter, climate change, COVID-19 response measures, the right to safe and legal abortion services, policing, economic and social rights, inequality and discrimination. These protests have underlined the vital importance of Article 21 in allowing individuals to express their views about how societies address their most significant challenges, as well as raising sometimes deeply divisive questions about what constitutes a peaceful assembly and what are the duties and powers of law enforcement. Against this backdrop, the Human Rights Committee adopted its 37th general comment on Article 21 in July this year. The general comment clarifies the scope and the standards of the right of peaceful assembly in order to assist the 173 countries that have ratified the ICCPR to fulfill their obligations under the covenant. It addresses a number of emergent and highly topical issues. Some of those were already mentioned, but including on the wearing of face coverings and how information technology interfaces with the promotion and protection of Article 21. The committee adopted General Comment 37 under the, the wonderful and apt leadership of Rapporteur Christoph Heinz during the committee's 129th session in July, which was held online due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This was the first time such authoritative international guidelines under human rights treaty bodies were adopted online. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate both Christoph and the committee as a whole on this significant achievement and for the exceptional level of commitment they have shown to continuing the vital work throughout this year despite the challenges caused by the pandemic. The adoption of General Comment 37 marked the culmination of a multi-stage consultative process which drew inputs from meetings with varied stakeholders in different regions, as well as information submitted by multiple member states, UN special procedures and bodies, regional mechanisms and civil society, including civil society organizations and academic experts. In my previous capacity as a member of the Human Rights Committee, I took part in the first reading of General Comment 37. It is now a very special privilege that I take on with enthusiasm in my current role as Assistant Secretary General to contribute to the vital work of raising awareness of and encouraging implementation of the General Comment and other important standards, particularly through OHCHR's guidance on less lethal weapons in law enforcement which was also published this year. This guidance is the result of a two-year process of research, drafting and consultation in collaboration with an international group of experts. It fills a significant gap in the interpretation of fundamental human rights and the application of principles of law enforcement, providing states, international organizations, civil society and other key stakeholders with guidance on when 
and how to use less lethal weapons in accordance with international law. The finalization of both the guidance and the general comment in 2020 represents a significant step forward in the authoritative interpretation of the international laws and principles relating to peaceful assembly. The nexus formed by these two standards provides us with vital direction on how we navigate the challenges and opportunities that will inevitably continue to impact the promotion and protection of Article 21. Awareness raising and partnerships are key to the effective implementation of these international standards. So I'm very happy that OHCHR has worked so successfully with the University of Pretoria on developing awareness and understanding of the general comments provisions. And that we have such a diverse range of stakeholders taking part in today's webinar. I look forward to hearing from all of the distinguished panelists and participants during today's discussion and toward our work in common to, into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ASG Brands Keres. Uh, it's great to see you through this medium uh, and warm greetings to you from South Africa. We're, we're very honored to have you uh, with us today and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Um, and I think I would like to really emphasize uh, what you have said in particular in reminding us that in fact, we are meeting on the 57th anniversary of the International Covenant on Civil and Pit Political Rights. Um, and that together with the, the two covenants, whether on economic and social and cultural rights, as well as on civil and political rights, they have been really instrumental in shaping constitutions and national legal systems. I think we really shouldn't take that for granted. And I would certainly agree with you um, that uh, with the new guidance we have, we have in fact codified and interpreted international law and principles related to peaceful assembly. And not least, that we must use these uh, standards for good in this post-recovery period. Human rights must be at the center of the, uh, of the response to COVID-19. We will now turn to our panel of five members. Participants will be invited to address questions to the panel members after their initial inputs. You are welcome to post questions or comments in the chat box for the question and answer session later. And let me just emphasize that you are able to do this in French and Spanish as well. We will do our best to direct your questions to the different panelists with us today. Um, and please do feel free to, to use the language of English, French, and Spanish. So with that, I would like to start by directing my questions to Prof. Haynes, who's with, it, uh, with us in the room today. Um, it's great uh, uh, to have you, Prof. Haynes. Uh, a lot of people have spoken about your amazing work as uh, part of the Human Rights Committee um, and in drafting uh, this general comment. Um, let me just recap a little bit and say that uh, Article 21 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political rights stipulates that the right of peaceful assembly shall be recognized. Can you tell us why the Human Rights Committee decided to draft a general comment on peaceful assembly? And what do you regard as its most salient features, if I may say? Prof? Thank you very much, Abigail and Franz. And good day to my fellow panelists and speakers and also participants worldwide from Pretoria, South Africa where we are celebrating the adoption of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also it's Reconciliation Day, 16 December, here in South Africa, and very apt for our discussion. So it's great to join you in the discussion on the international standards, on the way in which societies should deal with assemblies. Um, before I answer your question, Abigail, may I just say at the outset, thank you to a number of speakers um, for their contribution towards uh, the development of these standards. To the Vice-Chancellor for his welcoming words um, and the support of the University of Pretoria, to the work of my colleagues Stuart Marsland, Thomas Probert and myself in, keeping, in, in helping to develop the new instruments, my friend Ilza Brandt Keres, um, who as already mentioned participated um, in the drafting of the General Comment 37, it's a pleasure to see you Ilza, um, also Clement Voulet, uh, who played a key role in the development of these instruments. Um, that we will discuss today and who has recently issued a very helpful joint declaration on the right of peaceful assembly with other mandates. 
Barbara Fontana for the support of the Swiss government over the years to push the agenda of developing a new framework for assemblies. Francesca Fontuni, who arranged the regional meetings of NGOs while we were drafting General Comment 37. And I'm also delighted that Commissioner Carrillo joins us today. We have benefited greatly from the inputs from police officers throughout the drafting of the documents that are under discussion today. So may I emphasize the good practice that we saw with the general comments development and also Clement's new document on, uh, in terms of collaboration within the UN, for example, Clement is special rapporteur and we as a human rights committee, but also between the UN and the regional systems and also with the NGO community, as Francesca represents here today, um, in developing these standards. So to answer your question, um, why was there a need for international standards such as the ones that, that are on the table today uh, on peaceful assemblies to be developed? Um, as has been mentioned, assemblies play an important role in modern society, sometimes to renegotiate some elements of the social contract, sometimes to give expression to people's values, and sometimes for them to serve as spontaneous in the spontaneous acts of solidarity and celebration. International standards serve to emphasize that assemblies are a legitimate use of the public and other spaces. In some instances, however, volatile situations can arise, and the Vice Chancellor has referred to some of these examples in this very country and there are many others. In such cases where there's a high level of uncertainty, it is important to know what the rules of the game are, and that these rules are as protective of human rights as possible. The instruments are indeed designed to serve this purpose. And then in the second place, you asked about the main features. Um, and obviously, there are many that somebody like myself would like to go into, but to make it, uh, to, to get the issues on the table, let me just emphasize uh, four or five um, that I would see as the main cross-cutting features, especially of the general comment, but also then working together with the guidance on less lethal weapons. In the first place, traditionally states have seen the dividing line between protected and unprotected participation in assemblies as the question whether the participants meet domestic legal standards. If yes, they can proceed. If no, they can be dispersed. International law, however, view it differently. The dividing line, and this is set out in General Comment 37 as well, is whether the conduct of the participants is peaceful or violent. That is the critical question not compliance with domestic law. So, for example, the general comment provides that the fact that certain domestic legal requirements have not been met by its organizers or participants does not, on its own, place the participants outside the scope of the protection of Article 21. Nonviolent civil disobedience, for example, is covered. Some level of disruption may, be, uh, may have to be accepted as part of peaceful assembly. The fact that notification had not been given, for example, cannot be a criminal offence and make the assembly itself unlawful. Secondly, General Comment 37 requires an individualised assessment of the conduct of each participant and steers away from an approach where the assembly as a whole is assessed as protected or not and that is applied to all participants. Blanket bans and zero tolerance approaches are not accepted. For example, the General comment in paragraph 17 says, isolated acts of violence by some participants should not be attributed to others. And in paragraph 65, organizers and participants should generally be held accountable only for their own conduct, only in an exceptional case where there is serious and widespread violence within a particular assembly, can the entire assembly be deemed violent and subject to compliance where the rules on the use of force be dispersed. In the third place, I want to draw attention to the broad scope of the right that is recognized in General Comment 37. So the, the scope of the right is very broad and then any limitations um, are subject to restrictions. As the General Comment says, there are restrictions on the restrictions. There is a presumption in favor of gatherings being protected, while the onus is on authorities to justify any restrictions. So for example, some of the main questions we were confronted with during the drafting of the general comment were whether assemblies that take place entirely online are indeed assemblies. They are peaceful, but are they assemblies for the purposes of Article 21? 
and where the gatherings in privately owned spaces such as malls or airports are protected. General comment paragraph 6 is very broad and states, uh, as the Vice Chancellor has quoted, that Article 21 protects assemblies wherever they take place, outdoors, indoors, in public or private spaces, also offline and online. And around the online issue, I think there's been a lot of discussion. Um, and personally, I'm very happy that many of us who were initially skeptical about also recognizing fully online assemblies as protected by Article 21, uh, that we were persuaded and that we recognized this in General Comment 37. The right of peaceful assemblies is not an absolute right and may be limited, but any restriction must be justified. In the fourth place, linked to the above, is that the, the fact that the General Comment sets out the standards, the standard or default position on a number of contentious issues. And in other words, define the general rule and then sets out, sets out the threshold for, for exceptions. The thresholds are often set quite high. So, for example, preventative detention may be used, but only in exceptional cases and where there's proof of the intention to use violence. Stop and frisk may be used, but only where there's a reasonable suspicion of the commission of a serious offence. Generally, participants may wear face masks or conceal their identity, for example, online as well, but not where their conduct constitutes reasonable grounds for arrest. And then, in the fifth place, on the issue of the use of force in general, the general comment sets out the core contents of the right, but the UN sets strict word limits, and it was not possible to set out the basic standards on the use of force in general comment 37. However, it was also not necessary, because shortly before we adopted the general comment, the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights released the UN Human Rights Guidance on Less Lethal Weapons, in which a number of us were involved. On less lethal weapons, the general comment largely defers to the new document. The one point I want to emphasize concerning the guidance is that it requires new weapons to be tested and training to be conducted to ensure that those who use these weapons are well equipped to do so. So hopefully the general comment and the less lethal weapons guidance will provide a coherent framework on some of the key elements of the human rights approach to assemblies, whether entirely peaceful or whether involving some level of violence that will allow people to take an active part in shaping their societies while also preventing an escalation of violence where this is possible. The last word about assemblies is far from having been spoken. A number of us actively involve the extent to which the domestic laws in all countries in the world comply with the international standards and it's clear that there's a long way to go to bring the domestic standards in line with the international ones. But moreover, the devil lies in the detail. The general comment is on a fairly high level of generality and matters such as exactly how to deal with emerging technologies that enable, for example, mass surveillance and assemblies on private property will require the further ongoing dedicated attention of international bodies, police officials, NGOs, researchers, in short, all of us. I thank you very much. Wow, thank you, uh, Professor Haynes. Uh, there's quite a lot to unpack there, uh, if I may say. And uh, I'm hoping that perhaps during the discussion we'll be able to tease a little bit more. But if anything, I would like our participants to really hang on to this thought that Professor Haynes has underscored. And that is the fact that peaceful assembly is a legitimate use of the public space. I think that is really what he emphasized in the beginning. And then, of course, there are some limitations and he spoke a little bit about the right not being absolute. But if you can all hang on to that thought, and perhaps during the discussion, there might be a few more things that we can bring out. But thank you so much, Professor Haynes, for underscoring and really unpacking what is a complex uh, concept and a lot to digest. Um, I would like to now turn to Mr. Voulet. Uh, Mr. Voulet, you have been a special rapporteur on the rights uh, to freedom of assembly and association since 2018, and thus hold the primary position in the United Nations on peaceful assemblies. You and your predecessor have spearheaded many of the recent initiatives in the field and you have actively participated and made significant contributions, as many have already said, to the drafting of the General Comment 37. You have, for example, advocated uh, for the recognition of online assemblies as being protected and as part of this right. And I think we're really seeing this issue of online assemblies in the context of COVID-19. If you could please uh, comment 
on where you think the general comment helps to make the protection of the right further. How does this general comment advance that protection? And where do you think more work still needs to be done? Uh, as we know, implementation is the challenge, but where would you put your emphasis in determining where more new work needs to be done? Yes, um, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Abigail. And um, let me first thank uh, uh, the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights, but also the United Nations Office of High Commissioner for organizing these uh, important events. Uh, I might say that uh, this is the third event, if I'm not mistaken, that I'm attended on dealing, talking with uh, uh, on the issue of the general comments. So this also shows the importance of this uh, uh, document, but also its relevance for the current situation uh, uh, that we are living or uh, we are going through around the world. Let me also uh, thank also for my fellow panelists, and uh, I, I, I hope that through uh, our today discussion, we can also share among us and work better also with the public how we want to take this document forward and how this document also will contribute in, uh, in our respective work to really improve this fundamental freedom, which is important for democracy, is important also for the future of this planet. But let me also, uh, before maybe I, 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 I answer your question, let me also emphasize that um, uh, the context in which this general comment is, is coming in. As you know, for the last decade, uh, we saw that um, the world has faced very severe, and I think the, the Assistant Secretary also mentioned that, uh, growing poverty, we saw inequality, we saw also terrorism, we also saw digital transformation. So for this last decade, we saw that the world has faced numerous challenges. Uh, and and the, the freedom of assembly, the use for this fundamental freedom by people to be able also to, to participate, but also to tackle some of this challenge should normally be evident. Because if you look around the world, and if you look around the history, you will also see that Whenever the world faced this particular challenge, people were, are able to stand up using this important freedom, the right to come together, the right to, ask to, to assembly, the right also to come to the street to voice their concern. So people use this fundamental freedom, for example, to prevent for, this, the, the, for the uh, war, to prevent disaster, to come together and also call for change. So this should be normally evident whenever, because six the decades, our world is going to a heave, a heave challenge that I mentioned. Inequality is increasing, terrorism. We are also seeing, we are also seeing this digital transformation that people also don't know exactly where we are heading to. But we can also see that most of the governments done really uh, seeing this opportunity as an opportunity to have a conversation, dialogue with their citizen, most of the governments choose to repress some of the demonstrations that we saw. And recently, since two, if you remember 2019, the world went through a, a lot of revolution, and we saw also a lot of bloodshed, a lot of repression, and, and sometimes also based on misinterpretation of the, what uh, should be understood as a restriction of the, this right, what also should be understood as the enjoyment of this right. Many governments interpret the power given to them to restrict by the, 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 the components uh, uh, to restrict the right in particular uh, situation. Many governments use it as a rule than exception. And I think for me, the general comments came in this context. And we saw the COVID-19. When the COVID-19 came in, we saw that all of these restrictions, all of the challenges was magnified. And government, many governments, I recognize that many governments also did really uh, a good work in terms of uprooting this fundamental freedom when addressing the COVID issue. But many of them also just used COVID-19 as a pretext now to restrict. And we also saw that many authoritarian governments now become more powerful, become more uh, uh, really incentive on any kind of restriction to cancel any opposition. 
And I think the general comments came in this situation, which is really important for all of us, understanding better what's, what is the purpose of this fundamental freedom that is guaranteed by the covenant. And if we have to limit them, what is the limits, what the government should not be doing? And I think for me, this is, this is important because this mandate since its establishment in 2010, we monitor, like you mentioned, Abigail, all my predecessors, we monitor a lot of uh, pretests of our restriction. Many states using the law to restrict this fundamental freedom, the rights, and uh, in many jurisdictions, we, we, saw, we see that the, these rights is subject to the authorization than what we have been advocating for many years, which will be the notification. We also saw that based on this, uh, 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 um, this right also is subject to the stigmatization. You know, many people that use this right, we saw the repression of social movements. We saw also the repression of um, uh, civil society leaders, targeting civil society leaders that try to organize community in order com for the community to express their grievance on many, many issues that stayed there and was not resolved. And also we saw recently also many internet shutdown that was used in, by many countries during the uh, peaceful protests or during the election time. So for me, the, uh, the, the, the general comments uh, have this advantage really, and, and, and I want to also to applaud really the, the, the committee member that have the courage to be able to address some of these issues because Remember that we are in the context where many governments uh, will be incentive to see more the committee going of more trying to kind of restrict this right. But let me say that uh, uh, um, the committee was able also to really try to balance to ensure that there is understanding on the limits that the government will not cross in terms of limitation of this right, but also why this right is important to guarantee in any democratic society. You asked me some of the key elements that these rights uh, uh, the, that I find important in this. Uh, the first thing that I would like to mention is the universality. It's clear for me from this general comments that this general comment reiterates the universality of this fundamental freedom. Everybody has the right to peaceful assembly. Migrant, document migrant or undocumented migrant, everybody, foreigner, everybody. Compared to what I have, I am facing currently in many countries where the legislation is amended, and you you see that foreign doesn't have the right to a peaceful assembly. And when you question the government, many say our constitution is like that, and we don't we don't we don't we don't allow foreign to be to organize. We don't allow undocumented migrants. But this is fundamental freedom. By the committee insisting the, on the universality of this right, the committee is saying that this is fundamental right to be enjoyed by any human being. And I want also to emphasize also the question that you mentioned, which is online assembly. And I want to thank the committee member for their openness to listen, not to, to only me, but also to listen to many civil society members and, and to ensure also that these general comments is what I would call is future looking. It's it look to the future. Future meaning that today we cannot, we cannot talk about the assembly. We cannot talk about the peaceful protest without thinking about online space. And online space is the space that people use today to mobilize, people use today to express, and the committee recognized it. And committee by, for example, insisting extensively on the intersection of digital technology and the right to peaceful, the committee set up the framework that this right should be protected online as offline. And I want to thank the committee for that. And this is also particularly important during this COVID time. And there is no proof to give more than what happened during this COVID time, where the, it was the only space where we are able to connect with our leaders. We are able also to organize. We are able also to express our view, our political view, our view on how we want the world to move. So for me, it's important, it's important to emphasize that. And the committee also, one of the aspects that I think also is really important, by committee also insisting and saying that uh, peaceful assembly can take place uh, everywhere, it can take it, it indoor or outdoor, the committee reiterates also that indigenous people that are fighting for their land, because we are, what we are seeing increasingly is that 
some of the businesses are buying spaces that should allow indigenous people. They are buying public spaces. So the public space are privatized. And by insisting that, it means that the committee also reinforced this understanding that indigenous people that are fighting for their ancestral land, that is taken by them by businesses, that they have the right to protest, even if this place can be considered as a private place. As soon as it has this public function, this place should be also be allowed to uh, uh, be the place that uh, people can be able to protest. And I want also to emphasize also that uh, for me, the general comment also by the, 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 the way that it, 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 it defines the peaceful protest, it makes sure that everybody understands today that peaceful protest is not a privilege. It's a fundamental freedom that we, everybody, need to enjoy. And the committee also emphasized that because it's a fundamental freedom, it's a right that everybody, the, the best regime that will enhance the enjoyment of these rights is the regime of notification, not authorization. Because people don't need to require authorization before they enjoy what is fundamental freedom. And I think the general comment also, they need also to read the general comment. And another aspect that I want also to emphasize is the issue of violence, which sometimes is one of the most, um, I, I would say, uh, uh, difficult challenge that we have to, when we, we discuss with states, and you know, most of the, most of the, um, the basis of the repression is always that participants, for example, commit violence. And I think the general comment also provides a better guidance on that. And the general comment saying an assembly cannot be deemed violent or non-peaceful just because it involves disruption of movement or civil disobedience. Violence for the purpose of Article 21 should be understood as one characterized by widespread and serious violence. And I like particularly the fact that also uh, the, 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 the general comments also raise this question of whether or not an assembly is peaceful must not be answered with reference to violence that originates from a participant. Violence against participants in a peaceful assembly by the authority or by each as a provocateur acting on their behalf does not render the assembly non-peaceful. And the same, the same also apply for, uh, to violence by members of the public in, at assembly or by participants in counter demonstration. And it's clear from the Article 18 that uh, we cannot today uh, argue that uh, this assembly, agent provocateur, come and, 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 and draw stone in assembly, this assembly is violent. No. And I want also to say that um, uh, the general comment also uh, elaborates extensively on the criminal responsibility that uh, this should not be grounded on you. This criminal responsibility should be grounded on human rights principle. And while acts of terrorism must be criminalized in conformity with international laws, the definition of such crime must be must not must not be overbroad or discriminatory and must not be applied so to cattle or discourage the exercise of this right. And I, I want also to say that since the um, adoption of this general comment, why mandate use it extensively in communication? Uh, almost all the communication dealing with the peaceful protests that we send to the state uh, on excessive use of force, we reference general comments. And the recently, as uh, uh, Christoph Hens also mentioned that, we have also, we issue also joint communication with the regional system where the general comment also was referenced and also we discuss with the regional system on how we should be also working to ensure also that the general comment is also disseminated uh, uh, around uh, the world. And uh, one, another aspect that I want also is almost the 15 webinar that I attended, uh, 15 relevant webinar I attended since the adoption, I reference always the general comments. And I think in the future, this will also, the general comment will be also the important tool that we will be using when we visit country during the official visit, academic visit, because we, I think this document need to get to the law enforcement, it need to go also to the government so that people understand the importance of this fundamental freedom. They understand what we have been saying for many years, they, how, what, what has been put in the resolution of Swiss, ensuring that state need to take a measure at the national level to implement uh, the Article 21, I think the general comments offer the clarity on what states need to do and how our states also 
need to view this fundamental freedom. You asked me also area of improvements. I think for me today, uh, one of the aspects that I highlight, and, and, and I mentioned this to the some member of the committee, is that the general comment recognized that um, surveillance may have a chilling effect. And we know that today the technology, uh, the technology means as a facial recognition uh, have a really chilling effect. And because this, the involvement of this technology impact the enjoyment of this right, I think this is an area where we need also to really pay attention. How this facial recognition uh, technology undermine the exercise of this fundamental freedom. And my report on 2018 also set up some guidance the OSH, the High Commissioner report said that some guidance, but I need this is an area where we need also to develop further, even, even if the, the general comment did not go further, but it's an area where we need also to develop further. And I think also that uh, for me, it's, it's important also to highlight as a conclusion that we have an important tool in front of us today that tries to clarify the standard. And I think the change will come with how states will take these documents, how states will implement it, how states will understand the, 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 what, what is there. And I think it's important for me that, um, like we are doing now, that we try as much as also as we can to ensure also that these documents get to the state, that the states are able to have a conversation. It's not just about anyone, everyone sitting in his office and interpreting the document. They need to understand why this general comment and what this general comment is aimed for. Because we know that in many cases, states will always uh, take the part that uh, is important for them to use in order to restrict this right. So we need to take to, to ensure that we understand that this general comment is coming to help to build and to ensure that this fundamental freedom is exercised freely and without any, uh, 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 any, 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 any violence, but also without any restriction, undue restriction. So I would like to, uh, to stop there, and Abigail, and uh, I'm happy also to take any question that will help to clarify some of the things that I just said here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Clement. Uh, we, I think, uh, felt your passion. We appreciate speaking from the position of the Special Rapporteurship. And I personally was struck by the importance you attached to COVID-19, how on the one hand it created genuine challenges, but also the pretexts for government action. And then also highlighting, spotlighting, if you like, the importance of online assembly in the context of, of COVID-19. Thank you so much. Um, we trust that uh, Commissioner Corillo is with us. He had mentioned before that he has to leave us at the top of the hour, which is very close for another uh, prior commitment. Uh, Commissioner Correo, uh, as someone who advises governments and in particular law enforcement agencies on the use of force issues, also during assemblies, how do you think that the new documents, the general comment and the guidelines on less lethal weapons will affect the practice of states as far as the use of force is concerned. Over to you, uh, Commissioner Correo. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And of course, I have a written statement that I will read in order not to miss uh, any point. But it's my, my pleasure, uh, ASG Ilze, uh, dear Special Rapporteur uh, um, Clement, dear fellow panelists, distinguished guests. It's really an honor for me and a pleasure to participate in this uh, webinar on behalf of the United Nations Police uh, and to share, of course, our views on this important development of our collective efforts to build and sustain global peace uh, and uh, stability. The United Nations Police, for the ones that are not aware, uh, was first deployed in 1960 in the United Nations operation in Congo. And over the last 60 years, the United Nations Police has not only grown exponentially because the United Nations Police is the police of the member states or composed by police officers of the member states, has not only grown exponentially in terms of numbers, but also in its mandate and the broad range of responsibility it undertakes. Today, 
the mission of the United Nations Police is to enhance, as you just said, international peace and security by supporting member states in conflict, post-conflict and other crisis situations. Our goal is to realize effective, efficient, representative, responsive and accountable police services that serve and protect the population. To that end, we build and support or, where mandated, act as substitute or partial substitute for all state police capacity to prevent and detect crime, protect life and property, and maintain public order and safety in adherence to the rule of law and international human rights standards. The extent of the growth of the United Nations Police is evident in the fact that as of today, our mandated strength is about 11,000 police officers serving in 14 operations around the world. We work under the strict adherence to the various international treaties and resolutions relating to human rights and policing, and in that regard, we endeavor to be reference, the reference point for the best practices and standards for policing. This is even more critical in the world of today, where COVID-19 put a key uh, issue on the freedom and security, on the balance between freedom and security. As of today, the United Nations Police has compiled and continues to gather and develop best practices in policing with a view to improving our own organization performance, but also to share with our member states. This ensures that we build stronger ties and harmonize standards and understanding and importantly, it is a proactive way of preventing conflict through nurturing and encouraging policing standards that, that uphold human rights and eliminate or at least reduce the potential for conflict. Every police officer should be a human rights officer. I would say every police officer is a human rights officer. We have achieved these goals through our primary deployment to peacekeeping missions where we have contributed to building sustaining peace by transferring and entrenching these values in our host state police partners. We also work closely with the United Nations agencies, funds and programs, including OHCHR, through the Global Focal Point for the Rule of Law Arrangement, to support their work, notably in human rights and policing related programs and projects. I highlight that the United Nations Police, working with member states, academics, civil society and other stakeholders, develop the Strategic Guidance Framework for International Policing, or SGF at its goal. The SGF aims to enhance the effectiveness of the United Nations Policing through more consistent, harmonized approaches to the provision of public security, police reform, and support to host state police services, and to enable the more sophisticated recruitment of staff with the necessary specialized skills and competencies to meet the contemporary police peacekeeping demands and challenges. The necessity of this is clear when you consider that our police officers come, come from about 90 different countries, 90 different member states, each with different policing culture and approaches. To operationalize this guidance, we have also working with the broader UN police training architecture in curriculum development to standardize policing issues. Distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, the right of public assembly is one that has at times seen controversy stemming from the levels and manner in which states party have committed to protect and ensure the enjoyment of this right 
by everyone. The very nature of this right can give rise to a public order situation in which the state, through the police and, of course, after promulgation of the relevant laws and guidelines, is expected to enhance the enjoyment of this right and prevents any attempt to disrupt it. Of course, myself, as the United Nations Police Advisor, I greatly appreciate the paragraph 92 of the general comment, which stresses, and I quote, wherever possible, only law enforcement officials have been trained in the policing of assemblies. Only police officers, only law enforcement officials who have been trained in the policing of assemblies, I repeat, should be deployed for that purpose. As a general rule, the military should not be used to police assemblies. The law enforcement officials responsible for policing assemblies should be suitably equipped, including where needed, with appropriate less lethal weapons and adequate personal protective equipment. End of quote. This is critical. Policing should be undertaken by appropriately trained and equipped police, not the military. As already noted by other speakers, Article 21 states such assemblies may take many forms, including demonstration, protests, meet, meetings, processions, rallies, sit-ins, candlelight vigils, and flash mobs. And that, in many cases, peaceful assemblies do not pr pursue controversial goals and often cause little or no disruption at all. The same article provides grounds for potential restriction on these assemblies, but it cautions that any such restrictions must be narrowly drawn. In the extreme circumstances of applying such restrictions, the police may find themselves having to use force to achieve the immediate goals of such imposed restrictions. I must then hasten to say it is with these restrictions where we have witnessed various complaints relating to this particular, usually deriving from two issues. First, it is often because of the dereliction of the state in coming up with clear and reasonable guidelines relating to the restrictions as required under the article. Secondly, it is due to police and other security agencies acting out of bounds of the guidelines in place, almost invariably related to the use of force. Dear colleagues, it is from this later point that we take continued notice of the fact that any use of force must comply with the fundamental principles of legality, necessity, proportionality, precaution, and non-discrimination, and that, in any event, only, only the minimum force necessary for a legitimate law enforcement purpose during the assembly must be applied. This is captured both in our strategic guidance framework and in each United Nations field mission directive on the use of force. These principles, along with other guidelines provided by the basic principles on the use of force and firearms by law enforcement officials, the United Nations Code of Conduct for Law Enforcement Officials, human rights and policing, shall continue to be the cornerstones of United Nations policing and, as I said before, our curriculum development efforts are incorporating these issues. This important guidance on less lethal weapons also stresses the notion of state accountability on the use of force. While accountability mechanisms may include other actors, other actors like government, parliament, civil society, etc., the primary responsibilities lies with police and law enforcement agencies themselves. The guidance further states that monitoring, reporting, and transparency 
are essential components of accountability. To this end, police are supposed to keep record of stocks of their less lethal weapons, document any incident of the use of weapons, and then institute prompt and comprehensive France. Well, it seems we have lost uh, Commissioner Carrillo, Carrillo there for a moment. I think we uh, proceed. I think what I appreciate from his presentation is it, it is really a tour de force for me of uh, rule-based, principle-based, human rights-based uh, approaches to policing, which one doesn't uh, frequently hear. And I think in uh, Commissioner Carrillo, the general comment, the guidance has a, a very ardent advocate and a keen student, I think. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much to, to, to him uh, in his absence, perhaps, at the moment. We move now to Madame Fontana, who is the head of the human rights section of the Swiss mission to the United Nations in Geneva. And uh, she has been a key figure in the development of new standards in respect of uh, peaceful assemblies at the Human Rights Council since 2011. We ask uh, Madame Fontana that you perhaps share with us your insights about what you think the outstanding developments in the Council in this field has, have been in the last decade and perhaps also share with us your thinking about the main issues that are likely to arise in the near future. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Euh, Permettez-moi de vous remercier tout d'abord de l'invitation et de souligner combien je suis honorée euh, d'être parmi vous euh, aux côtés euh, des autres distingués panélistes. Euh, juste pour dire que j'aurais aussi préféré être en, en, en personne avec vous, euh, mais que juste euh, en termes de référence, derrière moi, j'ai un coussin que j'ai acheté en Afrique du Sud en 2013, après un séminaire qu'on avait organisé à l'Université de Pretoria avec euh, l'Académie de Genève, justement sur les manifestations pacifiques. En tous les cas, j'espère vivement euh, que la discussion d'aujourd'hui euh, contribuera euh, bien évidemment à promouvoir la guidance sur les armes moins létales et le commentaire général 37 et que tous les deux seront utilisés par les États à bon escient. Euh, la Suisse est engagée sur la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme dans le contexte de manifestations pacifiques au Conseil des droits de l'homme depuis 2011. Cette initiative découle de la vague de manifestations que l'on a pu observer durant le soi-disant printemps arabe. Ceci dit, l'initiative a toujours été conçue pour avoir une portée universelle. Très vite, un des aspects de la résolution a été de se focaliser sur les éléments de répression étatique et c'est pour cela que nous avons mis un accent important sur l'utilisation de la force. C'était assez difficile, à vrai dire, au début, de faire accepter toute référence au principe même de couvrir dans une résolution sur les droits de l'homme les aspects de l'utilisation de la force et du maintien de l'ordre public. Depuis, ceci est plus accepté et le texte comprend de nombreux éléments à cet égard, notamment sur les armes moins létales. Et plus récemment, nous avons même pu inclure une référence à la guidance sur les armes moins létales qui a été récemment développée, soutenue par le Haut Commissariat et que l'on promeut aujourd'hui. La résolution est empreinte par l'actualité et il y a aussi l'expression de préoccupation quant à l'utilisation à mauvais escient d'armes dans l'État. Par ailleurs, sur le rôle de l'armée, on reprend euh, volontiers les propos du commissaire Luis euh, Carillon euh, sur le fait que l'armée ne devrait pas euh, être, euh, être, euh, être utilisée euh, pour euh, la gestion de manifestations. Un autre aspect prédominant est bien entendu la déclinaison euh, du rôle des États afin de respecter leurs obligations et remplir leurs engagements, afin de promouvoir un environnement sûr et favorable qui permette aux individus et aux groupes d'exercer leurs droits. Cela va de la facilitation à la gestion, au rôle de la communication, à la formation, mais aussi à la documentation des violations et abus et aux mécanismes de réduction des comptes. 
Une tendance au début de l'initiative était de croire que nous souhaitions créer un nouveau droit, celui de manifester, ou le « right to protest », et cela n'était jamais notre intention. Nous avons toujours mis en exergue qu'il s'agissait de l'exercice de plusieurs droits, dont celui de la Réunion pacifique, expression et association. Par ailleurs, l'étude conjointe des rapporteurs spéciaux sur les exécutions extrajudiciaires sommaires ou arbitraires et sur les droits de réunion pacifique et d'association, qui avait été demandée en 2014 et conclue et présentée au Conseil en 2016, a démontré l'interaction des droits, ou plutôt l'interdépendance, voire l'indivisibilité de ceux-ci avant, pendant et après une manifestation, et surtout quand on a affaire à des manifestations physiques. Il n'empêche qu'il y, y a toujours la volonté de certains États de vouloir réduire les manifestations pacifiques au seul exercice de la réunion pacifique, et ce qui nous semble un réducteur. Un autre élément qui revient souvent dans les négociations, c'est bien évidemment la question des restrictions permissibles, mais aussi de la responsabilité des manifestants. L'appel principal lancé par cette initiative aux États est de mettre leur législation, leurs procédures, leurs pratiques en ligne avec le droit international. Ces dernières années, il y a eu des développements notables en vue de prendre en compte l'utilisation de nouvelles technologies et aussi les manifestations en ligne, touchant ainsi aux problèmes relatifs aux coupures d'Internet et des mesures violant les droits de l'homme et is when people are prevented from accessing information online, taking part in assemblies online. And the questions raised around surveillance, of course, are topical as well. The text adopted in June 2020 also take into account the exceptional situation of COVID-19 and has been requested of our special rapporteur who's with us today, and that should be available next uh, year. Many of these aspects have been discussed for the past 10 years. Now, what are the next steps? We don't have a clear idea. We have to think about it. Our objective, of course, is to continue to reflect uh, reality of the situation around the world and therefore we are closely following any developments. Um, since the beginning, uh, we have worked in close cooperation with the special rapporteurs, uh, but also uh, with NGOs. And we would like to thank them from for all their cooperation and engagement over the past few years. Of course, uh, we hope that by taking part in this uh, event uh, some people will have us uh, ideas of the best steps for the future i think that these webinars are always a source of inspiration thank you very much merci beaucoup madame fontana c'était vraiment uh, sympa de vous voir et puis un grand bonjour aussi d'afrique du sud ici on voit bien votre coussin uh, d'afrique du sud uh, merci de, de nous rappeler votre expérience ici. Euh, on vous remercie d'ailleurs pour votre engagement à ce sujet et d'avoir souligné les démarches euh, auprès du Conseil des droits de l'homme euh, et surtout la rôle, le rôle de la Suisse euh, dans ce contexte-là. Euh, je pense que vous avez souligné des points vraiment très importants et d'ailleurs je vois que les thèmes que vous avez soulignés au sujet des restrictions permissibles, les Internet shutdowns, c'est d'ailleurs des questions qui sont soulevées dans le chat. Et puis, on va essayer d'aborder ça davantage. Mais on vous remercie euh, chaleureusement de votre présence parmi nous aujourd'hui aussi et votre, euh, votre engagement depuis plusieurs années maintenant. I would now like to turn to Ms. Fanucci, um, who is a member of the European Center for Non-Profit Law. Uh, you were directly involved with uh, non-governmental organizations worldwide in the process that led to the adoption of General Comment 37. How involved were uh, uh, civil society organizations and what do you think they see as the most important and perhaps the most uh, helpful elements of the General Comment? Uh, how will they make use of this General Comment? As many has, have underscored, implementation is the challenge. 
What are those elements that you think would be useful in that implementation agenda for civil society? Ms. Fanucci, over to you. First of all, thank you for having me here among such distinguished panelists on the presentation of civil society. I'm pleased to say that the work towards the adoption of the general comment was a, a manual case of best practice on participation of civil society in the standard setting process at international level. ECNL, my organization, was involved from the very beginning in uh, 2018 when we successfully advocated for the Human Rights Committee to select Article 21 of the ICCPR on the right to peaceful assembly as the topic of its next general comment following the completion of the committee's work on the previous general comment on the right to life. In collaboration with uh, Dr. Michael Hamilton of the Law School of East Anglia University, we prepared a report for the committee that identified the, the gaps and needs regarding the protection of the right to peaceful assembly. And with the support of the OHCHR, we convened a meeting in Geneva with the Human Rights Committee members and the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Assembly and Association, Clement Boulet, to present the report and discuss the need for the committee to undertake the drafting of this general comment. And as a result, indeed, in October 2018, the committee kicked off the works on the general comment. And immediately after this decision, uh, ECNL set up a, a loose coalition of more than 20 civil society organizations, also involving the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Assembly and Association, to coordinate and discuss both the oral and written contributions, submissions, before each consultation organized by the Human Rights Committee. And I have to say, I have to underline, that the committee organized a fully inclusive and participatory drafting process. They held consultation on the draft document before each session and invited comments. And even their deliberations were held online in real time each time, the readings of the comments. Besides, ECNL, in partnership with uh, uh, the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, and partners from the Civic Space Initiative, uh, Civicus, Article 19, and the World Movement for Democracy. We are org organized regional consultations in Europe, in the MENA region, in Latin America, in South Africa itself, and in Asia, to discuss the issues, to really gather the evidence from the ground, the grassroots movements, on what were the main concerns and issues to unpack in the general comment. The conclusions and findings of these consultations were shared by ECNL with the Human Rights Committee and other experts at the retreat in Glion in March 2020, right before the final reading and uh, approval of the general comment. We are happy to say that the final text adopted by the committee does take stock of all the recommendations and analyses that came from the ground and from the experts that were provided in the two years leading to the approval. And in particular, we believe that what CSOs uh, appreciate and find particularly useful is, first of all, the inclusion of digitally, what we call digitally mediated assemblies in the, in the protection of the comment. And by digitally mediated, we mean both the purely online assemblies, but also those assemblies that eventually take place in the physical space, but use the digital media as a support for the organizations, the dissemination, the um, publicity, and also the post discussion on uh, assemblies. So um, this is, as was anticipated by um, the other panelists as well, is now fully acknowledged in the general comment. And um, it has become particularly relevant now with the uh, outbreak of the pandemic and the move of most of our activities online. Now, another uh, matter, another novelty which we pushed for and we appreciate was included in the general comment is that now even those assemblies that do not have a primarily expressive purpose are protected by Article 21. What does this mean? This means that it's not only those assemblies whose function is primarily of uh, protesting or manifesting, 
which is obviously commendable of primary uh, purpose, but also those assemblies who, who have uh, social and relational values. For example, people assembling for merely commemorative reasons or assembling to play games, both online or in physical spaces, or to take part in any other collective recreational activities. These assemblies now are also acknowledged and protected under Article 21. Finally, we would like to stress again the addition of private meetings um, to the non-exhaustive list of assemblies protected by this right. And this is particularly important because at the time we discussed this with the Human Rights Committee, there were countries in Africa as well where the police, the forces would break into private properties, into private homes, knowing that there were activists uh, reunited there to discuss uh, the, the organization of protests and they would use uh, uh, um, the force uh, to arrest and disperse these people in their own homes as they were preparing assemblies. So we advocated for assemblies held not only public spaces but also and not only in private spaces but publicly accessible but also in privately enclosed spaces to be added to the protection of Article 21. Bearing in mind that uh, enjoying the same protection doesn't mean being subject to the same type of obligations. For example, it tends to common sense, but it is also explicit in the, in the general comments that such meetings, such assemblies would not be subject to notification regimes, for example, due to the nature of their location. Finally, I would like to say that uh, we will continue uh, within my organizations and our partners to uh, disseminate, to raise awareness of the general comment and its protections among our partners on the ground, because we believe they should use the general comment to advocate for the integration of its standards into their national legislations. And they should also use it in support of uh, strategic litigation before their national, but also before international courts to strengthen the protection and precedence on the right to peaceful assembly. And that's all for me. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So much, um, um, Ms. Fanucci, for those interventions. And I think um, what is really vital uh, in terms of what you've said is, is that how this general comment has really had a grassroots approach. Um, and it's taken really the heartbeat from civil society and has been really reflective, in fact, of of many of those demands that civil society have made. And I think that's really important uh, that as a human rights community that we, we really maintain that uh, uh, this notion of participation in the development of a, a general comment and then thereafter in its implementation. Um, and that you also emphasize that, that uh, the importance of the inclusion of digital assemblies. And I think we're seeing that very much in the context of COVID-19 um, right now of, of the importance of recognition that assembly does take on uh, on the online space as well. Um, I think um, what we will do now is I really want to very much warmly thank our panelists for the interventions. We have a number of questions that are coming in. Uh, some of them are really, really interesting. Um, and I'm going to start by perhaps kickstarting uh, with one question. Um, and then, you know, um, Professor uh, Filohin and I will just um, uh, exchange between the two of us and, and really direct some of these questions of the panelists, because I think it will help us further on, in, unpack uh, the discussion that is before us today. Um, so the first one for me really is perhaps directed to the, the Special Rapporteur. Um, and that question is really um, around uh, somebody asking in the chat room today uh, whether you have any suggestions of how to build consensus, consensus between governments, civil society and independent mechanisms um, that is, exists, for instance, uh, with uh, human rights commissions, that might be one, one example. But if you could really expound a little bit more to say how can we really build consensus around these imp important constituencies, civil society, governments and independent mechanisms. Um, and then perhaps I will hand it over to uh, my co-moderator to ask a couple more questions as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank, th thank, thank you, thank you very much, um, Abigail, for, for, for this question. 
Well, I think um, consensus, uh, for me, the main question is consensus for on what and, and how. I think we need also we need also to yes consensus is important and what 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 I try to promote every time whenever there is a protest around a country is for me the dialogue is for me the open openness of the government to understand what are the legitimate claim of uh, people that come to the streets and I be, I believe really that people don't come to the street because they like it they come to the street because they have been really pushing for many things, or they have been expressing things that are not listened. And the only way that they can make sure that the community, they can make sure that uh, governments understand them is to come to the streets and also express their view. And I think uh, for me, this is important, uh, uh, where the consensus should, should be coming from is also being able to listen and to ensure that we understand the legitimate concern of the people. Um, I will say was I will say also that the, I mean when it comes to the independent expert sites, uh, one thing that we always uh, push and we always um, uh, make sure that it's clear is that we cannot be. I mean I know that this is sometimes very difficult. We cannot be uh, 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 neutral. We can be impartial, but we cannot be neutral. For me, is that every time those those questions around protests around um, is it government uh, arguing that uh, this protest is legitimate or not? For us, what we do is, is to ensure that what are the legitimate concerns that is protested, how people exercise this fundamental freedom. Because we know that in many cases, some government consensus means also that agreeing on what government wants to put as a limitation without really referring to the, what is a permissible, you see. So I think for me, a, a, um, this general comment, what this general comment is doing, is also starting building this consensus. States have the right to limit the exercise of these rights in very narrow situation. And states will keep on this. If states go beyond that, then you break the consensus. The document is there to provide the guidance, to provide the framework. And I think that ensuring that law enforcement, civil society work together with governments, independent experts, to make sure that law enforcement understand the the value, understand the parameters of where they have they can they can resolve to the limitation and where they are not allowed under the international law to do that will be also for me uh, important avenue of the consensus. But also ensuring that laws do not do not contravene or do not law do not be in contradiction with this. Because if, for example, we have um, this general comment and many governments say, OK, we are that, we want to implement, but at the same time, you still have laws that really uh, do not allow the enforcement of these general comments at the national level, then you are already creating uh, this kind of, uh, you, you are not creating the consensus because then you create the difficulties are already there. Civil society will be advocates for the change of this law. Or if you maintain this law, People will exercise their fundamental freedom and the government will argue with that. No, they break a law, while we know that this law is not compatible with the international standard. So I think for me, the consensus should be based on what is the fundamental, uh, what we should be defending as a fundamental freedom together. And just to tell you also that in a government that is not ready to promote this right, to promote this fundamental freedom, the consensus is still very difficult with civil society because, and even for, for the, with the aspect. But I hope that uh, through this general comment now, we will start already seeing many governments try as much as they can with the support of the civil society, UN experts, uh, uh, high commissioner, to really enforce this fundamental freedom, to really ensure that uh, government uh, agency, the department that deal with law enforcement are familiar with this document, and they implement it in a way that it's enhance the protection of this fundamental freedom, not I need completely the exercise of this right. Because that's, for me, the important part. If the measures are taken to prevent people to exercise this right, then we are not building the consensus. We are breaking the consensus. Let's say that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Clément, um, for that. Um, 
also insightful answer. Maybe just to give a bird's eye view of the proceedings, we will have a few rounds of questions now and answers, obviously. And then towards the end of the hour, we will do a roundup by giving each of the panelists a brief opportunity to succinctly summarize. Uh, another question we received uh, concerns preventive measures to uh, prevent, obviously, the use of excessive force. Um, the question really is, what signs should, be looking, should we be looking out for uh, to see that we can detect the warning signs of such occurrence of excessive use of force? And then what actions can be taken to actually prevent this rather than deal with the consequences of the violence? So I have my colleague here, Christoph, uh, Professor Heinz. Maybe we start with you and uh, if any of the other members of the panel would like to add. Christoph. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and as has been mentioned before, the criteria for the use of force include legality, uh, necessity, proportionality. So there must be a legal basis. It must be factually necessary. There must be a balance between the force used and the damage done. Um, but also, increasingly, there's recognition, and this is what, what is contained also in the general comment and in the guidance, um, of the element of precaution. Um, and then, of course, discrimination is, is a further one. So on the element of precaution, um, the important element there or the important focus there is that one a state cannot wait till the last minute um, or the authorities, the police in a particular situation, can't wait till the last minute and then say, oh, we had to defend one of our members or whatever the case was. And for that reason, we had to use force without trying to avoid that situation from arising in the first place. And so what is often said there is that one has to go further upstream and make sure that uh, measures are taken to, in the first place, avoid force from being used. But if force has to be used, to make sure that it's the minimum force that should be used. Um, and, and that's the element of, of prevention, precaution, which has been recognized widely in international humanitarian law, but increasingly now it's also emphasized in, in human rights law. Um, and so that has different elements. Part of it is the um, ensuring that um, the authorities and the police officers, the law enforcement officials, that they have preventative equipment. So for them to be in a situation where they are themselves at danger, but without being protected, for example, by shields or if it's necessary, by fireproof overalls, whatever the case may be, if they feel unsafe, they will often use force more easily. And in some states, they have the 21 foot rule. So if people come in within 21 feet, um, that they, they can then defend themselves, for example, by using uh, 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 firearms. Um, and to avoid that sort of situation from occurring, it's important um, that the police have the right equipment to protect themselves. So if some, for some, somebody comes with a Molotov cocktail, for example, uh, if the police are not properly protected, they will use force. So part of it is they must be equipped with protective uh, equipment. But they must also have less lethal weapons. Um, so less lethal meaning less lethal than firearms. Um, so to have this um, idea of a force continuum that you use the, less, the, the, the least intrusive level of force for a particular situation, if you only have batons or firearms, there's nothing in between, then once you go past the level where a baton can actually uh, be used by the police, then the next step is a firearm. So that's why it's so important that less lethal weapons are made available. They have all, problem, all kinds of problems themselves, um, but if they're used responsibly, they allow police officers to use only the necessary force that is used in a particular case. So the um, making less lethal weapons available and then proper training, because many of these uh, less lethal weapons now have high levels of technology, tasers, for example. So if one is not properly trained in its use, then it can actually escalate the situation. So the um, making these uh, less lethal weapons available, but also ensuring proper training and testing as well. Um, so that the only uh, weapons that, are, that can uh, fulfill the uh, legitimate purpose are actually used. And I think that's also linked to the idea um, and to the, to the important fact um, that, the, uh, as has, has been mentioned, that it's only people who are properly trained, and the police commissioner mentioned that as well, people are pro properly trained as law enforcement officials in the use of these weapons uh, should be used for 
for, as it's often called, crowd control. So the military are not typically trained for that sort of situation. So with the police, they are trained to use minimum force and then to escalate. The military don't have that constraint. And if they're not trained properly, and now all of a sudden they're confronted with situation, they use maximum force. Um, and so I think in terms of preventative measures, that's sort of very important as well. And we see it in many states now that the military are being used in situations where they're not used. The last point is just that I think uh, oversight is very important by national human rights commissions, by NGOs, um, by the oversight bodies for the police as well to ensure that if there is undue use of force or especially a culture of the use of force, that that will be addressed. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, Professor Heinz, for those, I think, very useful and informative responses. We have a question, more conceptual, question about online peaceful assembly. How do you define it? If you now look at a non-peaceful assembly online, isn't it more a matter of uh, freedom of expression being limited than perhaps assembly? That is the question. I think, can I ask maybe Ms. Fanucci to um, start us off? by um, endeavouring to answer that, uh, if it's possible, please. Uh, um, stigma, so to speak, or the, the, the usual question that we had to face at the beginning of the debate, long before the COVID outbreak made it painfully clear that we are all having online assemblies even now as we speak for obvious reasons. And another issue that was raised together with this aspect, uh, but you see the, the, the argument of uh, uh, the online world being simply uh, an extension of freedom of expression was actually applied also to assemblies in physical spaces. When we asked, uh, for example, to acknowledge assemblies not, not only with an expressive purpose, but with a rela relational purpose as well, we were told that assemblies, uh, at least uh, in, even in the initial conception of, uh, of the treaty, were intended as uh, articulations, as, as basically a special hypothesis of freedom of expression, an articulation of freedom of expression. So freedom of expression by more than one person in a physical place, all together with a common purpose. That was the common perception of assembly. We fought against this uh, conception because otherwise uh, the, the whole point of having a distinctive protection of freedom of assembly fails. I mean, wh why having an Article 21 if we already have Article 19 that protects the freedom of expression and it protects it everywhere by any media and in any place? The point is that freedom of assembly, both offline and online, has an associational value. The point of being together to either express, make a point, or simply by wanting to be together for gregarious reasons. I mentioned, for example, playing or exchanging, uh, um, you know, having even a, a gregarious uh, commemorative event. The point, we may not even have a common expressive purpose, may, all, may, may not all be there for the same reason, but we are there because we feel part of a group and we want to uh, uh, express this associational value by being part of an assembly, which is why this is an aspect of assembly that has to be acknowledged and protected both in the physical world and in the online world. The problem with acknowledging, you see, the, the trap in which one risks falling into is also trying to uh, make offline assemblies as uh, strictly equivalent to the online assemblies. So, so to think that what changes is only the virtual spaces and assemblies otherwise are exactly the same only in a virtual world. There are some elements that are actually quite peculiar of the virtual space. For example, the temporary elements. We advocated that there are also assemblies, online assemblies like the so-called hashtag let assemblies, where people join and unite at different times. Not There's not a contemporary element that reflects the contemporary uh, happening in physical spaces. 
So we have to be more flexible and understand that an assembly can take place online even in a more prolonged timeline than uh, in the physical space. But as long as this uh, willingness to participate uh, in a common discussion or in a common purpose as, as a group, as being part, as having an identity together, not being agnostic to each other's participation, that is what is an assembly. And we also stress the fact that in the nowadays world, that's why we we, we discussed online assemblies and then we ended up preferring the term digital, digitally mediated because nowadays assemblies are also hybrids. They may start offline, they may continue in the online world or they may start being organized in the online world, happen online, trickle down offline, go back to online discussion, etc. So we also advocate against a, a strict dichotomy between uh, what could be a physical assembly, which nowadays are more physical assemblies are more and more organized with the support of digital media anyway, and online assemblies that eventually are also the propellers of offline protests. So again, it's good to have acknowledged the online world, but now we would like to move even beyond the dichotomy of online offline and acknowledge that it is all a digitally mediated world with ramification, both in physical and virtual spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Fanucci. I feel like um, we could have a separate uh, discussion on, on this topic, and I think you've really uh, highlighted for us the, the nuances um, and, and the importance of not sort of having these rigid dichotomies when it comes to that, uh, that, that question. Um, you know, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, there's still a number of questions that uh, the participants have asked. Um, but we will be providing, as my co-facilitator uh, indicated, an opportunity for the panelists to wrap up, um, perhaps in a few minutes, each one of them. So perhaps as they are reflecting on their uh, closing uh, statements, I might just read out two questions that came up. And as they close, perhaps they could try to reflect on that. And I don't know if my co-facilitator might want to highlight a few more. But there was a number of questions around definitional issues, if I can call, that, that, call them that. And one of them was really this difference between peaceful assemblies and not so peaceful assemblies, right? That was, it's, it's a recurring issue that's coming out quite uh, frequently. And um, also how you would consider any assembly um, justified, especially um, in the context of COVID-19 lockdowns. So the question really there is, would you consider any assembly restrictions on assembly to be justified, especially in the context of COVID-19 lockdowns? I think that is another issue that has been emerging quite a lot. So I'll just highlight maybe those two um, issues that have come up and uh, perhaps my co-facilitator has a couple more and then we will proceed to the, the closing. No, I think, I think that's a good summary of the issues. I, I like the formulation though of, of this particular question. So my question is regarding violence and assemblies. How do we distinguish a peaceful assembly with the presence of violence from a violent assembly? So, so kind of, I think that's a succinct question as I understand it for the, for the panelists as well. Yes, there may be violence present in a, an assembly, but then there's a concept of a, a violent uh, you know, assembly as such, and, and how do the dividing lines between those work? I think that will also be very useful and interesting for the for the panelists to ponder on those. So I suppose we we start in the in the same sequence that we have. Uh, so, uh, Christoph, Professor Heinz, I we over to you for your succinct um, uh, remarks in summarising. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And obviously, that's a, that's a key question: is the difference between a peaceful assembly and a not peaceful assembly, because that's what the right protects. So I think the starting point is to say that only in very exceptional cases will an entire assembly be seen as, as not peaceful. So that's where there's serious and sustained violence, physical violence uh, to the life um, or the property of people um, or, pe or, or that can um, in, uh, implicate their physical integrity, injury, serious injury. That's the exceptional case. But the usual case is to say one should not look at the assembly as a whole but at the conduct of the individuals. Um, and the fact that there are, say, a thousand people there with 10 people who are violent, they have to be isolated and they have to, be, as far as possible, be dealt with directly. And the violence by those 10 people cannot be attributed 
to the assembly as a whole, unless, of course, as I've said, it becomes serious and, and, and widespread within the entire uh, assembly. And now this definition of violence, um, in the first place, if there's physical violence, and that's already started, yes, that qualifies, but there are also three other cases where it may be deemed to be violence, uh, violent, uh, the conduct of particular individuals or the assembly as a whole in that, those extreme cases. And that is where it's clear that, and there's evidence, that the intention of the people involved is to engage in violence. Or if the violence is imminent um, on, their, on, their, on their part, or they are inciting violence. Um, and that's a very high threshold where they're saying, we now immediately call on you to engage in violence. Not at some future stage, or we're talking philosophically about violence, but immediate violence. So if there's intention, uh, there's incitement or it's imminent, it can be deemed to be violent as well. And that's the threshold between a protected assembly and a not protected assembly. And, and this is often a gray area, but one is helped in this respect by the assumption that an assembly and the conduct of people is not violent, so it has to be proven to either already be violent or to be deemed to be violent um, as well. And one is also helped by the starting point that the violence by some people cannot be attributed to the others. So if focused uh, police action can be taken against that small group that is involved in violence, that should be done. In the extreme case, if it's not done, then the entire assembly may be deemed violent. And on the question of COVID, um, so, so within the time of COVID, the normal principles apply. Um, but of course, it's true that the right to health um, is one of the considerations that may lead to limitations. So in principle, yes, it's, it's possible that uh, assemblies may be limited in a time of COVID based on that particular provision, protecting public health. But this is, often, uh, this is often abused, and that's the danger, is that this becomes a pretext then to completely ban assemblies. Um, thank you very much, Christoph. Let's go to Special Rapporteur Vule. Uh, concluding remarks, maybe answering to the questions posed, but any general remarks that you want to conclude with. Clement, please. Yes, I uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, okay, again, th thank you also for the for again for the invitation. Uh, I think Christopher has already answered uh, well some of these questions, but uh, what I want to also point out around the violence is also that um, we need also to understand that uh, the that the the fact that uh, one person within we know that in many protests we have what we call agent provocateur. We know that in many cases, let us be honest, we know that in many cases, many governments don't have any interest to have certain political protests going on. And it's sometimes really easy to think that because one person becomes violent or external elements are attacking the protest, then this protest should be considered as a violent protest. And I think the article 18, the paragraph 18 of the general comment elaborates quite well on that. And it's important that the first duty of the state is to protect people that want to protest. Peaceful assembly is protected and state should, state should see the role of the state is to protect people, to ensure that people exercise their right. The exception is where, for example, the case of mentioned, many participants become violent and there is widespread violence. This is where, for example, there is a question in terms of limitation and in terms of how uh, the, this assembly can be qualified. So we, don't, we need to emphasize that because we don't need to give protest to the state in every time that one person from a protest draw a stone, then they, 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 they trigger the dispersal of assembly. And that's important if we want really to ensure that this right is exercised uh, as a fundamental freedom. And the second thing also is, yes, uh, in terms of COVID, in the case of Hans mentioned, uh, uh, health, health, uh, public health issue. And the main question, I mean, the question that we receive is not even the fact that there is no limitation. No, no we know that in terms of COVID, there is a limitation. Many states, they are both on the right and they take measures. The problem is that those, some of these measures are so broad and sometimes they are disproportionate. And finally, if you analyze them, the main purpose is not to address the health issue, it's more to attack the political issue. We saw many, one country recently that is going through election. How many, how many political leaders are arrested just because people gather? And at the same time, the ruling party is able to organize uh, the rally around the country. That's the problem. When you ask, you say that, okay, the, the gathering is not allowed, 
ruling party have the possibility to continue to go around the country and just the opposition leaders gathering or supporters gathering and we have already more, more, more than 40 people there. That's problem. The excessive use of force and the protest using COVID as a pretext to completely uh, 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 cast down the opposition leaders. And I think for me, and my wish today is also that uh, I want, uh, again, uh, I think the committee did his piece of work by providing this important document. And today is the responsibility of the state, is the responsibility of uh, UN agencies, but also academic institutions like uh, uh, University of Pretoria to really take this forward, to ensure that this is becoming a living document in the way that we manage assemblies, we have the, the another, another document management assembly, and the way that also we perceive assembly. If we perceive assembly to be negative, to disrupt economy, to disrupt, then we will always, law enforcement will always use the aspect of control, the aspect of force to deal with assembly. Let perceive assembly like a tool, a democratic tool, that people have to be able also to participate, to be able also to voice their concern. If we are able to do understand that and ensure that law enforcement understand that, I think we will probably uh, achieve a lot in terms of uh, uh, enjoyment of this fundamental freedom. Thank you very much, uh, friends, and uh, Abigail, for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, um, uh, moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Special Rapporteur Voulet, and thank you, as always, for your commitment. Um, I'd like to um, hand it over to Ms. Um, Fontana from the uh, Swiss Mission, um, and perhaps you can give us your reflections. Um, one minute um, before we close, we are a little bit pressed for time, but thanks again for your commitment. <laughs> no, and no, I'm going to go fast and speak in English because I didn't really have uh, uh, any 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 thoughts in, in in French in response to the two questions. I think I think what is what is important is that uh, there is uh, that. Uh, understanding in the general comment 37 about um about the violent intentions and the way um one needs to understand that i mean for in some of the conversations that that, that we've had uh, with the initiative uh uh, over time is that even just uh, the idea of changing the status quo or of uh, you know is considered by itself something that could be potentially violent and so it's uh, really a question of, uh, of of not giving too many excuses to um, those that would want to repress um, the issue of agent provocateur and and these kinds of, of, of things any any little violence being used as a reason to repress uh, what is otherwise a peaceful assembly um, or a peaceful protest is also something that we've observed and uh, that's where I think also if you have a, a, a protest which are, are um, how do you say, uh, uh, taking place over a long period of time and, and, and that may have different dynamics, uh, that one also needs to be uh, careful how uh, a specific movement is, is, is seen at any given point in time and try to avoid uh, making generalization that it automatically means that it's a violent protest. With uh, COVID-19, I mean, uh, fully agree with what I said before, uh, there is uh, still that, uh, th th that concern, obviously, that, uh, you know, restrictions must be proportionate, but not lead to the um, complete um, denial of the exercise of the right itself. And I think that is where the, the challenge is uh, in, in a context of a pandemic where, um, yeah, not, not everything is, is understood. Even we still don't think we understand everything about COVID-19. But there have been examples uh, over the past months of a protest taking place with, uh, you know, physical distancing and other things that have uh, shown that it is possible. To, to, to conciliate to both. And so, again, not, uh, not give an excuse again to governments to restrict a right, which is so fundamental. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks again uh, for being with us today. And finally, perhaps um, from the perspective of, um, of you, Ms. Fanucci, from the European Centre for Nonprofit, uh, what is your parting shots uh, in, in a minute uh, based on the discussion we've had today? Very briefly, I would say 
the major challenge that we face now from the civil society perspective is not only to convince member states to uh, make sure that there's legislation properly reflects the standards enshrined in the general comment, but also to convince the judges, the, 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 the law operators, to, to use them to refer to them in their interpretation of the existing rules. Because we found that in some countries the mentality is very insular. As briefly mentioned before, the, 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 the major point of reference is the constitution. And maybe if the constitution does not reflect the, the content of the general comment, that's it, we hit the wall. So we will try and also to make sure that uh, the, the mentality changes even in the long term. And we are planning activities, for example, of uh, awareness raising among even law students and journalists in, uh, in different parts of the world with the hope that this mentality will be ingrained at least in the next generation. But one suggestion, uh, one hope and one suggestion that maybe I would like to give with the to the um, Human Rights Committee and uh, with the support, ideally with the support of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Assembly is maybe in, in a year time or whenever, hopefully when the crisis of the COVID uh, is uh, well beyond, behind us, if we may have some kind of stock taking reflections from the country, member states, but also from civil society on what has been learned, what has been done at that point, uh, following you know, one year on from the approval of the general comment. Has anything changed? Has anything sunk in? What there remains to be done? Have there been any evolutions? That would be helpful, even if uh, the general comment as such already withstands the test of time. But just to hold uh, stakeholders, the member states, institutions into account on uh, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, they have uh, learned, what, what lessons they have learned, what remains to be done. That's all I can say. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Ms. Fanucci. Thanks again for your time, your commitment, your enthusiasm. And I think many of the points you raise are, are food for thoughts. Well, this brings us to an end, uh, fellow participants, esteemed panelists. I hope you will agree with me that we had quite a fascinating discussion this afternoon, uh, one that has given us a lot of food for thought uh, to carry on this conversation. I think for me, perhaps if I can say my own parting shots as I reflected and listened to everybody today is really to say, to bring us back to that Article 21 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that the right for peaceful assembly must be protected. It is not the context of the assembly that matters. In other words, the raison d'etre for the gathering, uh, but really based on two fundamental principles, that of participation and peacefulness. Um, I liked also this uh, a point that Commissioner Carullo, who unfortunately couldn't stay with us until the end, who said that every police officer is a human rights officer. I think that is an important takeaway. And then finally, just perhaps to say, uh, to bring us back to this uh, uh, implementation channel challenge that we are all confronted with, whether we work for the United Nations, government, civil society, that human rights do truly begin at home. Uh, we all have a responsibility to carry the baton and begin to see the implementation of this general comment. Uh, I wish to thank you and hand over to my co-moderator for his parting shots. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, um, Abigail. And thank you very much once again to all our audience members, all our contributors. Thanks to the University of Pretoria, Professor Coupe for the support. Thanks to the United Nations, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights for this collaboration. I think what struck me is that we had wonderfully rich perspectives from five vantage points. A state perspective, a civil society perspective, special mechanisms perspective, treaty bodies perspective, and then also, as it were, from the coal face, the, the police angle itself. And I think that was wonderfully rich and enriching for all of us, um, as I think we all uh, uh, agreed and benefited from this experience. For me, I think the way forward, any soft law instrument, as we know and as uh, uh, others have said, really depends on what happens after its adoption. I think factors that will enhance its authority and its persuasiveness would include the quality of its drafting, the use to which it is put, the fact that it fills a particular gap or lacuna that had been existing beforehand, and then the uh, extent to which it is taken up in promotional activities and being taken up as a part of the ownership of a constituency such as judges, civil society and, and others. And I think from what we learned today, in terms of General Comment 37 and the uh, guidance, um, we are on a very good footing. 
and our collective aspiration and hope, I'm sure, after today is that uh, this process of consolidating the authority, the persuasiveness of General Comment 37 will be um, something that will be visibly progressing uh, over time. And uh, in the process, we will see that uh, there is much more uh, peaceful protest and peaceful assembly uh, compared to the not so peaceful uh, protest and assembly. And that ultimately is, is the uh, aim of, of today's uh, gathering and assembly and uh, what had brought us here. So thank you once again to everyone and uh, we wish to see you on the road uh, ahead. Good day.